In the year 1912, the French government entered into an agreement with the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, commonly known as the French Line, to build four ocean liners over the course of the following 20 years. All of these ships would be entirely unique. In other words, they would not be of the same class or even have similar designs, like the Lusitania and Mauritania, for example. Ocean liner historian John Maxtone Graham theorizes that this decision was made because of the limited capacity of the port of La Havre, and that future enhancements to the port would allow the company to build more ambitious ships in the future. But it seems to me that this was just their preferred way of doing things. The first of these liners would be the 34,500 gross register ton Paris, which was laid down in 1914 and launched in 1916. Paris was not remarkably big or fast, but she was opulent, and would set the tone for the liners to follow. The First World War, however, delayed the actual completion of the Paris. She would not be ready for service until after the war in 1921, five years later than planned. The whole delivery schedule was pushed back, and the next ship, the subject of this video, would not be laid down until 1925. Now before I get further into this video, I have to ask for your forgiveness for my pronunciation of French words. I did take French for a few years in school, but it's been quite a while. To help me with this, I'll refer to Compagnie Générale Transatlantique as CGT, or simply the French line, for the duration of this video. CGT was eager for their upcoming quadruple screw ship, and was confident that she was destined for greatness and success. The ship was being built by a shipbuilder which got its start with CGT's SS France in 1912. Rather than trying to properly pronounce the name, I'll put it on screen now. Today, they are one of the largest shipbuilders in the world, and have built some of my favorite modern passenger ships, including Celebrity Millennium and Queen Mary II. Anyway, on March 11th, 1926, the ship was finally ready for launch in Saint-Nazaire. Thousands of people were in attendance, including officials of the French government, the leadership of the French line itself, workers, and members of the public. The new ship was officially named Ile de France, after the French region which includes the city of Paris. The literal meaning of the name in English is Isle of France. Then, the new ship slid into the river Loire. It took 14 more months to complete the ship, which would eventually reach 43,153 gross register tons, just a little under that of the Olympic class for comparison. On May 29, 1927, Ile de France went out for her first sea trials, which yielded mostly positive results, including a top speed of 23 and a half knots. The ship returned to the shipyard for some minor adjustments, and then to La Havre, her designated home port, where she arrived on June 5th. She was largely open to the public, especially the press, while she underwent inspections and final preparations for her upcoming maiden voyage. As her owners expected, the press fawned over Ile de France. Although she was probably aided by the fact that she was the first large liner to be completed post-World War I, after a nearly 10-year drought, the ship was indeed spectacular and deserving of attention. The first class accommodations were, of course, the grandest parts of the ship. As was typical of French line ships, she had sweeping and soaring public rooms. The main first class restaurant, for example, reached three decks high and was the largest such room at sea. Although the style of this room and most others on Ile de France were a bit sterile for my personal taste, it was undeniably remarkable and would soon prove to be popular with passengers. So I guess my opinion is overruled. There were accommodations for 670 first class passengers in 390 cabins, each of which was designed differently from all the others, furthering the French line's taste for uniqueness but Ile de France was notable for including very comfortable accommodations for the two other classes, cabin and third, which had space for 408 and 508 passengers respectively. Even in the third class, every passenger berth was a bed rather than a bunk. The Ile, as she is often known, sailed on her maiden voyage from La Havre on June 22, 1927. She stopped briefly in Plymouth before heading out to the open Atlantic. She completed the crossing in six days and was welcomed in New York at Pier 57. This warm reception, though, was only the beginning for the Ile. She would become one of the most popular and perhaps the most fashionable liner on the Atlantic. By 1935, the Ile will have carried more first-class passengers than any other transatlantic liner. And it's easy to understand why when she earned such accolades as, quote, 
cheeriest way to cross the Atlantic. And the Ile de France did quickly gain the reputation of being a party ship, so to speak. A reputation backed up by the fact that the ship featured the longest cocktail bar at sea, coming in at 27 feet. In the Prohibition era, this all became an attractive selling point for thirsty Americans. Writer Horace Sutton once wrote that, quote, The eel was built as a yacht and run as a house party boat. For those looking for recreation, the Ile de France had the longest shuffleboard court at sea, the proper length of a shuffleboard court being up for debate at the time. The party was interrupted a few times, though. One of these interruptions was for the installation of a new and very innovative amenity. In July 1928, the eel's stern was fitted with a catapult for something that is surprising, but maybe fitting for the Roaring Twenties, a seaplane. The catapult was powered by steam from the ship's boilers and launched a six-passenger seaplane 500 miles from the coast, allowing a small piece of the Ile de France to reach her destination a full day ahead of the ship herself. The plane was not a special amenity for the richest and busiest passengers, at least not primarily, but was used to deliver the mail ahead of schedule and the competition. Even though the experiment only persisted for a couple of years aboard the Ile, it demonstrated the innovation going on in the passenger shipping industry at the time. It was also a prelude to the rise of airliners and the fall of ocean liners, as the New York Times keenly pointed out in reference to the Ile de France. Service was interrupted again in 1933, when the ship was withdrawn from service to correct severe vibration issues, which had been with her since her completion. It was not the typical vibration issues that express liners often experienced, but rather it was the shaking and creaking of interior materials. As such, all of the wood paneling on board was pulled out, padded on the inside, and replaced. Finally, when World War II broke out in 1939, Ile de France saw the longest disruption of her glamorous commercial service. The ship was at Pier 88 in New York when the war commenced. Like her new fleetmate Normandy, which had previously been nicknamed Super Ile de France, the Ile was considered too precious to risk in hostile waters. And like a handful of other prestigious and important liners, Ile de France remained within the safe harbor of New York indefinitely. Her spot at Pier 88, though, was needed, and after two months, the Ile de France was moved from Manhattan to a pier on Staten Island without starting up her engines. She was moved strictly under the power of a fleet of tugs. Around the same time, her crew was reduced from 800 to just 100, just enough for the ship's upkeep. But before long, Ile de France was pressed into wartime service like so many other ships. The French ship was loaned to the British Admiralty in March 1940, painted gray, and sailed from Staten Island on May 1st, carrying war supplies including barrels of oil and aircraft. World War I, though, taught the Admiralty that merchant ships, even top-of-the-line ocean liners, were not good warships. So, like most of the large liners which served in World War II, the Eel served as a troop ship under the management of the P&O line. Toward the end of 1941, she returned to New York for a 120-day refit, which would increase her troop-carrying capacity, which would end up being just shy of 10,000 troops. The refit also included the replacement of her entire plumbing system and renovation of her propulsion system. When she re-entered service in 1942, she sailed to Southeast Asia, where she would operate out of Saigon, and paired with the similarly-sized liners Mauritania and New Amsterdam on the Cape Town to Suez shuttle. During this time, her officers were French and her crew primarily Asian. By 1943, though, she was recalled to the Atlantic to assist with the buildup of troops ahead of the D-Day invasion. During this time, her management changed hands from P&O to Cunard White Star and was manned entirely by European crew. Ile de France not only survived World War II, but had the honor of having provided immense assistance to the Allies during the war. During her wartime service, she traveled 400,000 miles and carried more than 600,000 troops. The EO was rushed back into commercial service by September 1945. She had her funnels repainted to her red and black colors, but her hull remained gray for the sake of time. Things were not back to normal, though. This early post-war service was scarce and lopsided, with most passenger traffic going west as people returned home to North America and escaped the war-ravaged European continent. On one westbound crossing, Eel carried 7,000 Canadian troops home. On the return voyage, though, she carried just 186 passengers to Europe. In the spring of 1947, Eel de France returned to Saint-Nazaire for major and much-needed post-war repairs and renovations. The French line was hoping to get the ship back into service within a year, but there was a lot of work to be done, and the shortcomings of the post-war global economy were not helping. 
Ultimately, the refit took more than two years. On the plus side, though, the ship emerged a more modern version of her former self. This modernization included the removal of all of her funnels, to be replaced with two bulkier, more modern funnels, rather than the three smaller originals. The ship also saw a new passenger configuration, which resulted in a more equitable distribution of onboard space, as well as the replacement of third class with the more dignified and comfortable tourist class. All of this meant a lower total passenger capacity, but a more comfortable ship and one which was better suited for the post-war era. Finally, the ship's exterior was, in my opinion, significantly improved by the inclusion of a false shear line at the bow. The eel incorporated minimal shear in her original design, a surprisingly common choice for CGT ships. But faux shear was an improvement, even though it was just an illusion. The renovation also included some updating to the interiors of the ship. While I don't personally think these changes were much of an improvement, I have to say that they were well received by the traveling public at the time. The Eel was a tremendously popular ship. Her interior aesthetic just wasn't for me, but I don't want to misrepresent her status as a first-rate ocean liner based on my personal preferences. Some compromises were made in the interiors of the Eel due to soaring costs. For example, many structural elements of the ship were left exposed, even in first class, where they would normally be creatively covered up. On July 21st, 1949, Ile de France finally resumed her proper commercial transatlantic service when she left Le Havre bound for New York. It had been just about a decade since she had been serving in her intended role as a transatlantic ocean liner connecting France and the United States. The post-World War I Ile de France nonetheless had the staying power to compete with the more modern liners of the post-World War II era, including the America, the Andre Doria, and eventually the mighty SS United States, which would also connect New York and La Havre, France. But the beloved Ile de France remained in vogue. Celebrities and dignitaries flocked to this ship, despite all the competition. The Ile had an allure which stemmed partly from her pre-war reputation. Rumors that seagulls followed the eel's wake hoping for scraps of food thrown overboard suggest that the cuisine served on board aided the eel in her quest to remain in fashion. Ile de France drew even more attention to herself when, on July 25, 1956, she was involved in the sinking of her contemporary and competitor, the SS Andrea Doria of the Italian line. The eel picked up 753 people from the Andrea Doria after the Swedish ship Stockholm collided with her off the southern coast of Nantucket. Andrea Doria had been sinking very slowly, and she was relatively close to shore, so Ile de France's intervention didn't necessarily save all those survivors from inevitable death, but her actions did make her even more famous and celebrated. As favorite as she was, Ile de France was not able to escape the realities of an ocean liner in the 1950s. The ship, like so many of her contemporaries, was relegated to cruising duties for part of the year. One time, in the winter of 1957, the ship ran aground off Martinique. Her passengers had to be flown home, and the eel herself, with two of her four propellers damaged, had to be towed all the way to Newport News in Virginia. In a way, this incident signaled the beginning of the end for the eel. Air travel was picking up significantly, both in terms of popularity and feasibility, by 1958. Despite being a post-World War I ship, the Eel was still a premier ship, but even she could not escape the realities of the changing economic and technological landscape. As with other express liners, Eel de France's passenger numbers were on the decline. In November of that year, 1958, the famed and favored Eel de France departed New York for the last time. Even back in 1958, there were hopes that the historic Ile de France would be saved from destruction and be able to move on to serve as a museum, hotel, or something along these lines. It might have been a bit early for this sort of ambitious preservation though. The French line ultimately sold Ile de France to a Japanese scrapyard because the price was too good to refuse. The Ile sailed from La Havre on February 26, 1959, bound for her new owners in Japan. When the ship entered international waters, the French flag was replaced with the Japanese flag, and the ship was officially renamed, as is common when a new owner, even a scrapyard, acquires a ship. From Ile de France to Furanzu Maru, her new Japanese owners chartered the world-famous ship to a Hollywood film studio to be used as the set for the movie The Last Voyage, in which she would play the role of a fictional ship named Clarendon. The director-producer of the movie, Andrew Stone, actually wanted to use the much smaller Arundel Castle for the movie, but due to the filming schedule, that ship would not work. Ile de France was the second choice. The French line was not pleased with this arrangement, presumably because the movie was about a sinking passenger ship in the Pacific Ocean. 
This would, of course, have the potential to have a negative impact on the reputation and brand of the already struggling French line. The company was at least successful in having the paint of the iconic funnels modified, prohibiting the use of the ship's famous name, Ile de France, and prohibiting the inclusion of actors with French accents. Although I have to say that the modification of the paint on the funnels was minimal. After experiencing a lot of damage during the filming process, Ile de France was finally delivered to Osaka, Japan for scrapping. This would have been a sad moment for frequent transatlantic travelers because, as John Maxstone Graham points out, Ile de France was up there with Queen Mary and Mauritania in terms of extreme popularity with the public, a height that even the short-lived but legendary Normandy could not reach.